Star Wars is arguably more science fantasy than science fiction, but the franchise has nonetheless hugely influenced what we want to see in our sci-fi. We want lightsabers and blasters wherever possible, and if we ever get armed spacecraft in our galaxy, we're probably gonna compare them to X-Wings. But if we had the means, how would we build one? What's keeping us out of dogfights like you'd see in the Star Wars movies aren't the ship shapes or weapons necessarily, but the propulsion systems. X-Wing engines have a very specific look, size, and functionality, and that's what allows them to fight like they do. So if we wanted to build our own space fighter, what real rocket science would we use? First, we should establish what are the engines we're looking for. We are gonna be looking at the T-65 model of X-Wing, the most common model, and it has an engine with a diameter, four of them, about this big. So any technology that we use is gonna have to scale relatively small compared to the powerful rocket engines that we have in use now. Our real X-Wing engines it's space, there's no sound. Our real X-Wing engines are also gonna have to generate massive thrust because the ships themselves are massive around, according to the canon, 10 metric tons. Mass isn't as much of a problem in space, but it is if you want to go fast quickly like a space fighter would want to, and it is if you are constantly entering and exiting planets' gravity wells, as they often do. Finally, our propulsion systems need to look right. That sounds trivial, but the classic red and blue glow coming out of the back of Star Wars ships' engines is just as iconic as anything else. And so, ah! we can use a good old fashioned chart to help us determine which real or at least possible propulsion system would work best. All right, now I'm gonna walk out. I saw what happened to Django. Now we need to survey the propulsion systems available to us and compare and contrast. It's a different one this time. You should be surprised. Let's start with the obvious. Chemical rockets like we use in the Saturn V or the Falcon 9. Both produce a mountain of thrust, but to do so, they have to use a lot of very, very heavy fuel. Upwards of 90% of these vehicles' weights are just fuel. Now, given the size differences here between these vehicles and the X-Wing and how much fuel they would need to take with them to dogfight and enter and exit atmospheres, chemical propulsion just really isn't the way to go and it doesn't look right. So how about something a little bit more space age? This is a very basic diagram of an ion engine. It uses electric fields and how charges are repelled and attracted to each other to fling out tiny charged particles from the back of it and create thrust. Now, these engines are definitely real and they look right, and we've actually used them on space missions. But because the charged particles they are throwing out the back of them are so small, have so little mass, the thrust that they generate is minuscule. It can take days, weeks, months, or even years to accelerate up to space fighter speeds. You can put your hand behind the beam and it'd be fine for like an hour. I checked. Not exactly what you want from a nimble space fighter. And so, we can make our first evaluations. Although chemical rockets have the thrust that we want, they are way too big and their exhaust does not look right. Ion engines, on the other hand, are small enough. They look right, but they do not have the thrust that we want. So maybe we should go a little bit more sci-fi. They cut his head off. They cut Jung Django's head off in... F he had a kid. It's a kid's movie. In the 1950s, the design of a new kind of propulsion system began. So-called Project Orion wanted to harness the incredible power of nuclear explosions by throwing nuclear bombs behind spacecraft and having those spacecraft ride the nuclear bombs as thrust. No, really. Development was ultimately halted on these so-called nuclear pulse engines because of the possibility of, you know, clouds of 
radioactive fallout all over the place, but in theory, they could generate a monstrous amount of thrust, enough to take us to the nearest star in just a lifetime. However, I think you can tell that these don't really look right for an X-Wing and they're too big. Too bad. I think we need to go a bit outside of what we've actually tested and into theoretical territory in order to stay on target for an X-Wing. Nuclear fusion engines are still out of reach for us, but only just. The simplest setup for a rocket could be one that has gigantic magnetic fields that combine a plasma and uses something like microwaves to heat up the plasma so hot that it actually fuses, and then magnetic nozzles throw all the fusion products out the back for thrust. More awesome configurations of the nuclear fusion engine involve instantaneously collapsing cylinders of metal like lithium around a plasma and then flinging that all out the back. The point being, nuclear fusion engines have something that most all other engine configurations don't have, both high thrust and high exit velocity from the back, which is important. Chemical rockets, like in the Saturn V, have very high thrust, but very low exit velocity. And ion engines, like you'd find in a TIE fighter or one of our spacecraft, have very low thrust, but very high exit velocity. Not only do nuclear fusion engines look the part, they, in theory, could be shrunk down. We are working on that right now, and in the Star Wars universe, they have mastered magnetic confinement in their lightsabers, so... plausible? But if our technology was advanced enough to make fusion engines, we might want to consider another propulsion system that uses the most efficient fuel source known to science, antimatter. When identical matter of opposite charge come into contact with each other, they annihilate and release an enormous amount of energy in the form of charged particles and radiation like gamma rays, according to Einstein's E equals MC squared. Now, you could just use magnetic nozzles to throw all this stuff out the back, and that would be fine. Or, or you could take something like hydrogen and pump it into the engine and heat it up using the energy that you're producing from the matter-antimatter reactions as a reaction mass and throw that out the back for even more thrust. Antimatter engines look the part, and in theory, they could be very small. Antimatter is so efficient in its production of energy that just an M&M's worth could take you to Mars. Let's complete the chart. See how that happened? It's in the remaster. So it looks like, using our criteria, the only two engines that fit the bill for a realistic X-Wing engine are fusion engines and antimatter engines. They each have the thrust, the size, and the look that we want. Whether the engines for our space fighters are configurations of antimatter or fusion engines, there are many permutations of both and some even combine the two, is going to come down to which is the more attainable breakthrough for us, nuclear fusion or mass antimatter production. Right now, the estimated cost to produce just one gram of antimatter, a paperclip's worth, is $62 trillion. And though we have experimental fusion reactors, we haven't yet been able to get out more energy from one than we've put in. And so, how would you build a real X-Wing? Well, that all hinges on having the correct propulsion system, and at least for now, it seems like humanity's best bet is to focus on nuclear fusion engines, at least until antimatter production gets a bit cheaper. Both antimatter engines and fusion engines, though, have the thrust, the look, and the efficiency we would need to create the first real starfighter, and both configurations make way more sense than the ion engines that Star Wars gives all of their spacecraft. But then again, it is not that hard to give a slightly more scientific answer in a universe that also includes midichlorians, is it? Because science told you, you gotta shoot first. I told you. A really interesting thing about a lightsaber, if it was real, is that because the blade here would just be contained plasma. Plasma is a gas inside of a magnetic field. It wouldn't weigh anything, or next to nothing, just a few grams. So if you've ever held a lightsaber, they have heft to them, a replica lightsaber, because 
this plastic bit is, is heavy, but if this was a real lightsaber, it would only weigh as much as the hilt. And if you were swinging around, it would feel like you just had a remote control in your hand that you could move around hyper quick and not slow like a sword. Thank you so much for watching, Jerry. If you want more of me, check out Muskwatch with me and Dan Casey or go to projectalpha.com and sign up and you can get this show two days earlier than anyone else and you can get the space program, which is a bit more premium. And thanks to Ultra Sabers uh, for Ray's lightsaber here. It's pretty cool and it ups my surprise game. And oh, my hand, just kidding, nerd. <laughs> <laughs>